Father in heaven, thank you again for the blessing of giving us a day when we can come together and worship you and rest in you and in your world and rejoice in you and in your world. We ask now that as we consider again some of these difficult and climactic parts of the Bible, that your spirit would be with us to give us wisdom. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are in Revelation 6, and we're breaking open this book that's sealed. The eighth letter. Seven letters to seven churches, and then the eighth letter to the eighth church, which is Babylon, Jerusalem. And also the beast in its seventh and final head, Rome, the apostate beast. But primarily, since the center of the covenant is Jerusalem in the Old Covenant, Jerusalem is in focus here. Somebody remind the class, tell our visitors why we assume that Revelation was written before A.D. 70 and why we assume that it's dealing with the destruction of the first creation and the full coming in of the new creation in Christ. What would be the best argument for that? Yes, sir. The first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that it says these are things that are soon to come to pass. Okay, it's soon to come to pass, but suppose I were to say, well, really, it's soon, but Revelation, guys, there are notes back there if you want to take notes or follow along. If I were to say, well, it's soon, but really the book was written about 95 A.D. and deals with the end of the Roman Empire. The next thing I would say would be the fact that there are two writings of uh, the Revelation, and one of them, the number of the beast is in the 666, which is Nero, Nero. In uh, Hebrew, I think it is, and then in uh, Aramaic or something like that. It's 616, which is also Caesar Nero in that language. Okay. During his rule. It would have to be before Nero. Okay, now one could argue that 666 could also be Domitian or someone else. Is there an internal argument here, a global argument, that pretty much proves this has to be before AD 70? and has to be dealing with the end of the old creation. Well, suppose Babylon is Rome and not Jerusalem. Bob? Well, I think the logic kind of fits. There's a lot of pieces that just yeah, are the same thing. And uh, when uh, Jesus tells the Jews at that time that the judgment of all the prophets is done for the promised generation, yeah. I think literally speaking correctly there, and Okay, the logical flow from old to new, Jesus' predictions concerning the destruction of Jerusalem being the end of the old, everything in Revelation dealing basically with the old. And there's just one little teeny weeny detail that I'm groping for and no one's mentioned yet. And I'm surprised, frankly surprised, <laughs> that there's one person who hasn't thought of it. But she will. Is Jesus presented in this book primarily as the Son of Man or as the Angel of Yahweh? Who are the mediators of the Old Covenant? Angels. Who passes judgment in this book? Angels. Okay. Who will pass judgment on the end of the new creation? The men will. We will judge angels. To me, the clincher argument is, and I'm glad we had this exercise because now you've all been stimulated to think about it again. The clincher argument is, if this book is dealing with stuff that's still to come or stuff after A.D. 70, we've got a major problem because it's angels who are bringing the judgments. And the New Testament makes it very clear in Paul, in Acts, in Hebrews, that angels are the revealers, the mediators, the judges, the overlords of the first creation when we were in our minority, in our childhood. And that in the New Covenant, Christ is revealed as the Son of Man, no longer as the angel of the Lord, it's the church that will judge the world. The church will judge angels. The keys of the kingdom are given to us. And we will be the ones who will pass judgment. In other words, if this is around the second coming of Jesus, why are angels doing the judging? It should be us. And if you say that this book is dealing with the second coming of Christ, 
I don't mean the end of Revelation chapter 20, which does deal with the second coming and pushes forward, but the main part of the book. You say the main part of the book is dealing with the second coming or even any events after A.D. 70, you're in real conflict with what the rest of the New Testament says about angels and men. But if you see that the book is signified through angels, that in only two places Jesus is revealed as Son of Man, all the rest of the places in Revelation, Jesus is revealed under the animal symbols of the Old Testament and under the angelic symbols of the Old Testament. It's angels who pass judgment in this book. Then you see that it's the end of the old creation. And there's an overlap between the old and the new creation between A.D. 30 and A.D. 70. And that period of 40 years is the to the Jew first period. We don't take the gospel to the Jew first now. When you want to plant a church in a town, you don't have to go find a synagogue and start there. But for 40 years, that was the modus operandi. For 40 years, there was a gift of speaking miraculously in foreign languages as a sign to Israel. Now, we still have the gift of tongues today, but the gift of tongues today is translating the Bible into every language. Before the gift of tongues, the Bible was kept in Hebrew. Now, God says, take it into every language. He gives a spirit for that, and so the work of translation is the general form of that. But the special form was from A.D. 30 to A.D. 70 as a sign to the Jews, but that ended. Paul could still go to the temple and offer sacrifices. He could still take a Nazarite vow, and at the end of that Nazarite vow, cut his hair off and put it on the altar fire. Can't do that anymore. So there is this overlap time where the Old Testament Jews are given one last chance, there's this final harvest, and then the Old Covenant comes to an end, and angels are the ones doing that. Remember our rule, the Old Covenant is mediated by angels through animals to us. It's animal imagery, animal sacrifices, Adam is put in the garden to learn from animals. Angels are communicating truth through animals to men. In the New Covenant, it's man to man, face to face, Jesus to us. But when we were children, in nursery school, we had our stuffed animals and the angels were teaching us through them. And everything in the Old Testament is animal. Animal faces. Four faces of the cherubim, the first three are animal faces. Ox, lion, eagle. Then we come to man. So Revelation is ending the old creation. And you see, there are a lot of arguments about the date of Revelation that go to Irenaeus and church fathers and all this stuff. We don't need any of that. The internal evidence in the Bible is what we need to focus on. For my mind, it's clear, and that's our modus operandi in here. So that's review. Now, the book starts off with Jesus, and he gives seven letters to seven churches. And remember, those letters would have come in scrolls, rolled up and sealed. And the pastor of the church, who is at least the one person who would be able to read. Remember, people didn't need to read in the ancient world. Only a few people needed to read. There weren't many books. So who needs to read? It would been a waste of time to learn to read unless you could afford to buy books, which were terribly expensive. So most people didn't read. But the one person who could read in the church would have to be the pastor because he was going to expound the Bible. So he would break the seal on these seven letters, on his letter, and read it to the church. Now Jesus gets from the Father... The book with seven seals on it. And that's the letter to the Old Covenant church. And it's a type. Jesus says to the seven churches, each one of them, He says, I have a little bit against you and I'm coming soon. Or He says, I know you're suffering, but don't worry, I'm coming soon. And when I come, I'm going to set things right. I'm going to deliver those of you that are suffering and I'm going to punish Jezebel. And I'm going to punish Balaam and Balak. And I'm going to punish the Nicolaitans. I'm going to set things right when I come, and I'm coming soon. Then he says, let me show you what I mean by coming soon. And that's what all the stuff in the rest of the book is about. If you want to know what it means for Jesus to come to the church and change things and set things straight, take a look at what I'm about to do to Jerusalem, which is the church of the old covenant. And the eighth letter is the letter to Jerusalem. John is going to eat it and preach it to Jerusalem after Jesus breaks it open. Now this letter, since it is really the judgment on the entire old creation from Abel to Zechariah, from Abel to John the Baptist, from Abel to the saints who die in the A.D. 60s, it has seven seals on it. So it is a large scroll, and it's rolled up, and there's seven seals. And each seal is about the size of a hand, and it is a gob of wax, and remember, we looked at this, you take a cylinder seal, a cylinder seal is about the size of your finger, and you roll it out on the wax, like that. And it makes a picture, because 
carved into the stone of the cylinder seal is a picture. We had pictures of this from the ancient world. But seals were kept on thongs around people's necks, and they were like a little rolling pin. You'd stick a pin in them, and you'd roll it out on a piece of wax, and as it rolled, it would make a picture. And the book of seven seals has seven pictures on these seals. The first picture is a white horse, probably white wax. Then you have a strip of red wax with a red horse on it. Then you have a strip of black wax with a black horse on it, see? And a strip of green wax with that horse on it. And then you have a picture of the saints under the altar, a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem, and a picture of the silence in heaven and what happens next. And then the book is open. And then Jesus pops each one of these seals. The seals, these seven pictures, hold the book shut. And this is the book of judgments. All the judgments of all the sins of the old creation are now rolled together and brought on them. The iniquity of the Canaanites is full. They're dealt with. All the blood from Abel to Zechariah is fulfilled on this generation, but it's been held back. But as the seals are opened up, now the judgments can be broadcast and they will be trumpeted and then poured out. So we're opening the book. Each one of these seals shows us something that was held back in the Old Covenant as God held back His judgments because their iniquity wasn't full yet. It also shows what's going to happen now. That's where we are. In chapter 6, the Lamb is breaking the seals, not the Son of Man. The Son of Man isn't breaking these seals. The Lamb is breaking these seals. Of course, they're both Jesus, but it's the Lamb. See? The wrath of the Lamb. Old Covenant imagery. When the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and this is the first one, I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come, Maranatha. You ever heard that word? That's what he says. Maranatha. If he was saying it in Aramaic. Come. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is the lion. There are four cherubim up in the heavens. The first one is a lion, the second one is the ox, the third is the man face, and the fourth is an eagle. They look like sphinxes. They got six wings, and maybe they don't look like sphinxes, maybe they look like men. We don't know, but we know they had six wings in this star formation, two over the face, pointing out like that, two flying, pointing out like that, two covering the feet, pointing out like that. So they are six pointed stars, and there are four of them. And they are the dragon that guards the throne of God. And the first one is a lion. And the lion says, Maranatha, and the white horse comes. Now, we are saying that all four riders are Christ and all four horses are the church. The church rides. The church holds up Jesus. Jesus rides out on the church. The church carries him into the world, carries the principles of the kingdom into the world. You could say that both horse and rider are together one image of the gospel going forth, of Christ riding forth. But I think you can also say the horse is the church and the Christ is the rider directing the church. So we don't burn at the stake for that distinction. We don't burn at the stake for very much of these particular interpretations in Revelation. We just do our best. But we really need to see that these are not demonic forces that are under God's control. They are pictures of the gospel and how the gospel goes into the world, and really all four of them are Jesus. There's no need just to say the white horse rider is Jesus who conquers. Jesus also takes peace from the earth. Jesus also regulates the bread and wine. Jesus also brings death to his enemies. So all four are really Jesus. And the first horse and rider are Christ riding forth to conquer. This is the first thing the gospel does, is evangelism. And the first thing the gospel proclaims is that Christ is king. What is the gospel? What is the good news? Most people today would say the good news is God saves sinners. But it's true that God saves sinners, but that was known throughout the Old Covenant. That is not the new news. The gospel is we're justified by faith alone. Hmm? That was known throughout the Old Testament. Everybody knew that. That's not what's new. If you look in the book of Acts, you'll see that the gospel is that Jesus has finished the work and ascended into heaven and is now king. That's the good news. The fact that God saved sinners through the blood of an atonement, that was known in the Old Testament. That's not the news. The news is, and I'm very serious when I say this, if you study it, you'll study it in Acts, what they're preaching is the resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of Christ. 
Which is why Acts is funny to us. We're so used to preaching Christ crucified, and we start looking in Acts, and it keeps talking about how He has ascended on high, and now He calls all men to repent, and He's King of kings. We're not used to that emphasis. But that's what was new. Until Jesus died and went to heaven, there was no man on the throne. The covenant hadn't been fulfilled. So the good news, the distinctive evangel of the new covenant, is yes, God saved sinners. Yes, we're justified by faith alone in the blood of Christ. But primarily, and what's new, is He's King of kings. And now, all nations are called to repent. All nations are to become theocracies under Christ as King. All nations are to be taught to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. It's going to go everywhere because He's King. Everyone will bow the knee. That's the message. That's the conquering message. Jesus has a bow because He's a greater Jonathan. He is a replacement for Saul. Therefore, He's also David because Jonathan made David his replacement. And he rides forth conquering. That's the white horse. Now we get the red horse. What follows the proclamation of the gospel? The red horse. This is chapter 6, verse 3. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature. This is the ox face saying, Maranatha. And another red horse went out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. This is called by the bull, the ox face, which is the altar. We studied this before as well, but these four faces, we have the Ark of the Covenant, the throne here, the altar here, the table of showbread here, and the lampstand here. The altar is the ox, the throne is the lion, the table is the man, humanity, and the lampstand is the eagle. And this is the direction that the four faces come in. First of all, the throne, white horse. Then the red blood of the ox comes afterwards. This is the direction. Then we'll go to man. And finally, we'll go to the eagle face in terms of what we're doing here. Now, the ox calls for peace to be taken from the earth. And the red horse goes out. Now, remember that we said this is not talking about literal war. This is the removal of the peace that Jesus talks about. Repeatedly in the Gospels, Jesus says, whenever the Gospel goes forth, it will pit father against son, daughter against mother, husband against wife, kids against their grandparents. It will divide things up and there will be conflict. Revelation is written in symbols. We don't say literal wherever possible in Revelation. We say symbolic wherever possible in Revelation because it says that the book is written in symbols, just as a rule of thumb. So we don't expect this to be a literal war. We expect it to be a symbol, and sure enough, it is. It's a symbol of the conquest of Canaan, but in the Gospels, that conquest brings conflict. As soon as the Gospel goes out, some people convert and some don't, and then they're at odds with one another within families. And Jesus says this repeatedly. And a great sword is given to him, and that's the sword of the Word. It's already been identified in Revelation that the sword is the Word of God, and as the Word of God goes forth, it brings this conflict. So we have two stages. The gospel is proclaimed, Christ is King. Some people accept it, some don't, and they wind up getting into fights with each other. Husbands and wives, fathers and sons. Great conflict arises as a result. Now we come to today's lesson, <laughs> after all this review. And that is the black horse rider, and this is the most difficult one. So we are on page 67 of our notes. Chapter 6, verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, Maranatha. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. He who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures. Now, this would be the voice of God in the throne in the midst of the four creatures probably God the Father, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Most commentators will say, this is famine. No, it's not famine. Famine comes in the next one. This bread, wine, oil are sacraments. And this is a judgment against the sacraments of the church. This becomes clearer when we understand that black is the color of the onyx stone and of Joseph. And we've already seen in our studies that the 12 gemstones of the 12 tribes inform the color symbolism of Revelation. And this is the tribe of Joseph. Joseph is the onyx stone. Joseph, you'll remember, replaced the baker and the cupbearer of Pharaoh. 
the baker and the cupbearer of Pharaoh were tossed into prison with Joseph and they each had a dream and so forth and so on. Joseph becomes the baker because he's in charge of all the bread, all the grain. He saves up the grain and dispenses it. And he also becomes the cupbearer because who remembers the proof that Joseph is the cupbearer? Yes. The cup that he used to advise Pharaoh, the silver cup, the cup it's called, was put into Benjamin's sack, which shows that he was also the cupbearer. So Joseph becomes the new baker and the new cupbearer, obviously a type of Christ. And so he feeds the people bread and he feeds the Pharaoh wine. Now notice the difference there. In the Old Testament, everybody gets bread, only the king gets wine. Kings drink wine in the Old Testament. I mean, other people can too. But what attention is called to, kings drinking wine, kings have cupbearers. Everybody gets bread, kings get wine. Now, in the New Testament, today, you're going to get bread and wine because Christ is now king and in Him, we're all kings. But in the Old Covenant, it wasn't so. In the Old Covenant, everybody got bread, but the priests were forbidden to drink wine in God's house. Well, today, you're encouraged to drink wine in God's house, you see. So wine, as a sacrament, is distinctive to the new covenant, and so is oil. If you got sick in the Old Testament, you could pray for help, but God had not said, anoint with oil anyone who is sick. But in the new covenant, we are told, if you're sick, call for the elders and have them anoint you with oil. So oil is a sub-sacrament, healing, anointing for healing. There are two sacraments and two sub-sacraments. The two sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper. The two sub-sacraments are manual imposition, which means laying on of hands to make someone an elder or deacon. That only goes to some people. And anointing with oil for the sick, which only goes to some people. But we believe that those are real things. God really works through manual imposition. God really works through anointing with oil. God really works through the waters of baptism and God really works... We're not specifying how He does. We're not Roman Catholics, but we are Reformed. God really does something in baptism and God really feeds Christ to us in the Lord's Supper, for better or worse, but never neutral. Joseph is the new baker and the new cup bearer. He gives the cup of wine to Pharaoh. He gives the bread to the world. Oil isn't mentioned. Now, what we see happening here is that Christ rides forth and He brings this partial famine. A famine on bread, but not on wine and oil. Now, what would that mean? This is a hard one, I think. And it may be that I haven't got it right, though I think I do. But it's been hard for me to express. It seems to me that what we're getting here is a judgment against the bread, which everybody got to have in the Old Testament, but no judgment against the wine and oil, which are the distinctive new covenant blessings. And it's not that the bread has completely disappeared, but it's that you have to use a whole day's wage for one loaf of bread. If it's wheat, wheat is good bread. Now, barley is not so good bread. So you can get three loaves of barley. Now, that's your whole day's wage. You don't have money for anything else. You're in kind of bad shape. It seems to me that the idea is that God is thinning out in this stage of history, the third thing the gospel does is it starts to thin out all the old blessings, but the new blessings of what is coming in, the kingdom of God, are untouched. That seems to me what is being pictured here. The oil is untouched. It represents the Spirit. The wine is untouched. It represents kingship and rule. And at Pentecost, we have the new wine. The men said, we're not full of new wine like you think. But we've got the oil of the Spirit. So wine and oil are associated with Pentecost. They're given. And the old bread is thinned out. The wicked are judged. The saints are preserved. The Old Testament, the priests would eat the bread, but they couldn't drink the wine. Now the bread is thinned out. And that means they don't get anything. But in the church, we get bread and wine. If the bread is thinned out, that's hard for us. But we still have wine and oil. We still have the Holy Spirit the life of the oil. We still have the wine, which is our privilege of talking to the Father face to face as princes in the kingdom. A prince can go in and talk to the king. Slave can't. The old time we were children under governors and tutors, we were like slaves. Now, 
We're in there with the king and we drink wine at his table because we're princes and princesses. We are engaged to be married to the king's son. We're at the table. So even if there's not much bread and we're physically hungry, we have these privileges. But the others, you see, they're losing the bread, but they don't have the oil and wine, so they are being terminated. I think it's important for us to reflect that way because this is clearly sacramental here. Now, we're not talking about regular famine. We're talking about bread, wine, and oil. I mean, there is no judgment against asparagus. Plenty of asparagus. But bread and wine are what we're talking about. Now it says Christ carries scales. Scales would be used to measure out the wheat and barley. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 16, if you want to jot that down. Ezekiel is told that during the judgment on Jerusalem, the people would weigh out their bread with scales and eat by measure. That would be in the background here. But it's also true that scales are the astral sign of the tribe of Asher. And we have studied this also in this class. And if you are just with us today or new with us, you'll find on page... 69 and 70, a picture of which tribes are associated with which star signs. And if you want more on that, I have information on it, but I'm certainly not going to try to take the time to go through all that again today. The star signs do seem to figure in here. And scales are the sign of Asher. We get this from the Old Testament, from looking at the positions of the tribes and then just associating them with the constellations, which God does refer to, remember. The Bible refers to God setting up the constellations and their meanings, and so this is why we draw these assumptions. Asher turns out to be the scales, and this is what's said about Asher in Genesis 49.20. As for Asher, his food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. And what's interesting is this is the only tribe that anything is said about food. Well, Judah, it says, his eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white with milk. But that's it. I mean, Issachar is a donkey who gets a lot of work done. Dan judges the tribes. Gad, remember Gad is the archer in the heavens. And Gad, raiders shall raid at him and he will raid at their heels. We looked at this last week. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Naphtali is a hind let loose. We looked at Naphtali, the virgin, the white stone, which is the white horse, the first one. But Asher talks about food. And here we are in the third thing talking about food. And the scales are given to Jesus. And what do you know? Asher is the scales, and Asher talks about food, as well as in Deuteronomy 33:24. It's connections like this that indicate to me that this scheme is right because it works out. If it didn't work out, we'd have to question the scheme. And Revelation pulls everything in the Bible together, everything. Sometimes you just have to keep trying different schemes until you hit the right one. I think this is right. Deuteronomy 33:24 says, Of Asher he said, Moses said, More blessed than sons is Asher. May he be favored by his brothers. May he dip his foot in oil. Your lot shall be iron and bronze, and according to your days so shall your leisurely walk be. So there's an association of oil with Asher, which would also tie in here. Well, that's for your completeness. Here in Revelation... What we're finding is that the church removes the old bread and brings oil to quicken the new bread. God is decapitalizing the old ways. Even if the saints are hungry, they still have wine and oil. If we were to look at some of the Old Testament antecedents to this, we find that a famine of bread forced the Hebrews to go to Joseph and the Gentiles. Now, compare that to the situation we're in right now. These are judgments against Israel. And they are going to be forced to go into the Gentile world and into the Gentile church. This happens more than once in the Old Testament. But it was a famine that forced the Hebrews to look to Egypt and where Joseph was. Now, where is Jesus now in A.D. 60? Is Jesus in Jerusalem and Israel or is Jesus in Antioch with the Gentiles? Well, he's in Antioch with the Gentiles. That's where Joseph is. That's where Jesus is. And these proud Jews are going to have to leave Jerusalem because of the famine and go to Antioch where Jesus is. Antioch is the center of the church during the to the Jew first period. Similarly, famine forced Elijah to go to a Gentile woman. There was no food. His heavens were as brass and the brook gave out. And where did Elijah go? He goes to a Gentile woman. Now in Luke chapter 4, 
we find that Jesus shows up on the scene and they say, is not this the son of Joseph? Now, in Luke 4, that doesn't mean Joseph the carpenter. It means Joseph of the Old Testament. And Jesus says, yeah, I am the son of Joseph. And you know, there were lots of widows back in the days of Elijah, but he didn't go to any Jews. He went to a Gentile. And that's reference back to Joseph, you see. A lot of starving Hebrews, but Joseph went to feed the Egyptians because the Hebrews were apostate. The Hebrews had to come to Egypt to get food. And then they take Jesus out to stone him. Here again, the idea, just as Joseph's brothers tried to kill him. So he really is the son of Joseph, you see. He's here to feed the Gentiles, and his brothers try to kill him. Well, you got to go to the greater Joseph to get the bread. So that's the black horse. And very quickly, I want to deal with the green horse because in the sermon, I need to go further and deal with the saints under the altar. So let's just spend the last five or six minutes here looking at the green horse rider. This horse is green. He's not a pale green. He's not a sickly green. He is as green as grass. That's chloros is the word used here. My Bible says in the margin, sickly pale. No, or an ashen horse. No, it's green. It's the word chloros from which we get chlorophyll. Why is he green? Well, there aren't any real green horses, but this is a vision. He's green because green is the color of the emerald, which is Levi's stone, and Levi is the tribe who brings judgment against sacrilege. Let's look at it. Verse 7 and 8. When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature, this is the eagle-faced cherub, saying, Maranatha. And I looked, and behold, a green horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. That's Jesus. Jesus has the name Death. And Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the land. Land of Israel. Land and sea in Revelation. Land is Israel. Sea is Gentiles. Over a fourth of the land to kill with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, and with the wild beasts of the land. All right? These are the real literal judgments. This is the real famine here. The third horse is not a famine. It deals with the sacramental dimension. The fourth horse has the literal famine in it. The eagle in Revelation is the one who brings the climactic judgment. The fourth part of Revelation is the eagle part. We've done this before in here. The chapters 1 through 3 are the lion. The seals are the ox. The trumpets are the man. The man is the priest who blows the trumpets. And the bowls and everything afterwards is the eagle. And the eagle is called to pick out the eyes of the wicked. The eagle is called to the vulture feast or eagle feast actually in Revelation 19. And so the full judgment that comes here, death and Hades, is the eagle judgment called by the fourth of these cherubs. And the horse is green, and that's Levi. Remember that the Levites were stationed around the tabernacle in the temple to kill anyone who tried to encroach on the altar or to get into the tabernacle. Only priests were allowed to go to the altar. They had to wash their hands and feet of the labor first. They had to baptize themselves. And then they could go to the altar. No one else could. If you were a layman and you tried to go up there and put something on the altar or just touch it a little bit, most Levites would... That'd be the end of you. They'd shoot an arrow through you or stick a spear in you. If you decided you wanted to get inside the tabernacle and look around and see the table of showbread, see the altar of incense, look at the lampstand, you wouldn't get through the door. They'd be dragging your body away. Because those Levites were stationed around and they were armed. The Bible tells us this in books like Numbers, which we all kind of skim through. You know, you're reading Numbers and you flip through page after page till you find a story and you read that and then you find more laws and things. You skip all that and you find another story. I know how you guys read the Bible. That's the way everybody reads the Bible, you know, unless they study out the details. But if you were to get into all those detailed passages that we tend to skip, you'd find the Levites were armed and they were stationed around to kill anybody who encroached. Same way with Mount Sinai. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be killed. Well, the Levites got this job at the golden calf. At the golden calf, Moses said, who's on God's side? And the Levites said, we are. He says, well, then go through the camp and kill everybody that's guilty. And so they killed 3,000 people. And as a result, God made them guards. If we were to look at Numbers 25, it's just down here, you'll find Phinehas is the greatest of the Levites. When the Moabite women came down and seduced the Israelite men, Phinehas went into a tent and ran a spear through a man and a woman together. 
And God says, because he did this, I'll make my covenant of peace with him. Samuel is a Levite. Samuel chopped Agag to pieces in 1 Samuel 15.33. So, the Levites, what is this green horse? The green horse administers these Levitical punishments to the unfaithful Jews who professed to serve Yahweh but didn't. Remember that judgment starts at the house of God and it's to the Jew first. And as the seals are opened, we're only looking at judgments on Israel. Later on, the trumpets will expand this out to the beast and the false prophet. But the judgment starts with the Jews and then it expands out to Herod and Rome and Jerusalem. All three of them are dealt with by the end. But the judgments here are on the Jews. The Jews said that they were serving the Lord, but actually they were encroachers on His altar. He was not pleased with them, and so He sends the Levitical green horse, the emerald horse, out to pass judgment on them. And the one who rides the horse is Jesus, and His name is Death, because He is the great Levite. Levites kill. And that's what we're all supposed to be. Jesus writes in these letters to the seven churches, I have this against you, that you haven't kicked enough people out of the church yet. Remember, that's what he says over and over again. I have this against you, that you tolerate these apostates. I have this against you, that you have allowed the Balaamites to teach in your church. And I have this against you, you know. You're too easy going on heretics. Kill them. Now, we don't kill with the sword. I mean, we kill by telling people the truth about the Word of God, which many times kills people and makes them alive again. That's the great thing about the sword of the Spirit, is it has a way of killing people and then bringing them back to life again. And we'll see some of the armies here in Revelation are in fact armies of the church riding forth to kill the wicked in the sense of killing them and bringing them to life again. But here, Jesus is death. He is the great Levite who is bringing judgment on the apostate Jews. And Hades, the place of the dead, follows him. Remember, Hades is where you go when you die. Up until A.D. 70, everybody who died went to Hades. Some went to the hard part, called torments. Some went to the nice part, called Abraham's bosom. But nobody went to heaven. And that's what Revelation is all about. Heaven is locked up, and Jesus is opening it in this book. And at the end of the book, the saints go to heaven. And now when you and I die, we'll go to heaven. And only the wicked will go to Hades. But right now, Hades, or the grave, is following after Jesus, who is death. It says a fourth of the land was destroyed. And this provides hope for the rest. See, this is a warning judgment. When the trumpets come, we'll find a third is destroyed. And when the libation bowls come, all is destroyed. But the initial judgment is just a fourth, and that provides hope for those who remain. Remember, it's always possible to repent as long as you're alive. This is real death here. The previous judgments were symbolic war between families because of the sword of the word, the famine of sacramental acceptance. These judgments are literal and fourfold, and you'll notice that there is a chiasm here, top of page 69. The white horse conquering and killing corresponds to the wild beasts, which is the last thing mentioned here. The red horse of war and death corresponds to death. The black horse of sacramental famine corresponds to famine, and the green horse of death corresponds to sword. So we have killing, death, famine, death, Sword, famine, death, wild beasts. It works out that way. We won't do this, but if you were to look at Matthew 24, 7 to 11, you'll find that Jesus predicted all these things. He says there will be wars and rumors of wars before the destruction of Jerusalem. He says there will be great famines in diverse places. He says, what's the death? I better look at it anyway. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. That's the death. And then he says that many will fall away and betray, and false prophets will arise and mislead many. And those are the wild beasts. Wild beasts in the New Testament are false prophets. The beasts in Revelation, those are men. Remember Titus chapter 1, verse 12? The Cretans are all lazy, evil beasts. We were seeing that. Second Peter 2.12 and Jude are there. Second Peter 2.12, Jude 10, Titus 1.12, 1 Corinthians 15.32, and Acts 19 all show us that the wild beasts are the false prophets who are destroying the vineyard of God. So what's happening here? What's the order of the gospel? And then we're going to stop. First of all, there's evangelism. Christ is king. That comes from the throne. What happens when you go out and proclaim that Christ is king? Well, after a few months, after a year or so, some people convert and others don't. And so there's conflict 
and it's fire, fiery red conflict, and that's on the altar. The second horse. Father against son. Mother against daughter. Husband against wife. You know, the wife is being beat up by her husband all the time. Goes to the missionary and becomes a believer. And then the husband beats up on her all the more. Well, there's more conflict that shows up. Conflict is heightened. The third thing that happens after that is that gradually, now that the gospel has made a beachhead, now that conflict has come and everybody's divided into two camps, those who hold to the old and those who go to the new, watch this happen. Evangelism, division, the red horse. After a few years of red horse division, now we've got two camps, those who cling to the old way, those who are moving into the new way. What happens then? Then God begins to starve the old way. He begins to decapitalize the old way and continues to bless the new way. Now, as that happens, everybody goes through a certain amount of suffering. The believers don't get much bread either, but they have the oil and the wine. They have the future. And so, the third phase of the gospel coming into a place is, after the division takes place, God begins to decapitalize the old way and bless the new way in hidden ways. And then finally, the fourth thing that happens is God destroys the old way and leaves the new way. Now, that takes place over 40 years. That's what's going to happen here. The gospel will go forth. There will be division. After a few years, we got two camps. God begins to judge the wicked camp and finally destroys it, and now the gospel stands forth. But that happens every time the gospel goes somewhere. Every time the gospel goes somewhere, it goes in those four phases. Our time's up. If you have your notes, you'll notice here I have given you a chart of the stones and astrological signs, and I've also given you a star chart showing the pole star. The dragon, which is around the pole star, corresponds to the four cherubim and their faces. Then we have the Levitical signs, which are around the throne of God, of uh, Merari, Gershon, Kohath, and Aaron. And then we have the tribe signs. And if you want an extended discussion of that, I have a paper that deals with it, but I know that that goes way beyond what most of you want. But I thought I'd go ahead and toss this in. This is the best I've been able to do with it. And it works out pretty well. I mean, scales winds up being Asher, and that fit with what we saw and other things. Obviously, Judah is the lion and so forth. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the Scriptures and their encouragements to us. And we thank you for revealing to us what will happen when your gospel goes forth. And we live in a time when the gospel has to go forth again and create divisions because everything is muddy right now. We ask that you would give us the strength to do that, to be part of your white horse riding in history and help us to understand more and more what we see you doing in our time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.